Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. Um, I've got a great interview lined up for this afternoon um, and I'm going to be chatting to someone who I've met in the past, uh, an incredible woman uh, who has literally dedicated her life to rescuing and protecting often sick and injured rhinos. Um, and her name is Petronel Nivot. And um, I'm going to get her on the line now. Um, she founded the largest rhino orphanage in the world literally and um it's right here in south africa so let's see if we can if we can get her on the line um, and get her to join us so much for tuning in guys um if you have any questions please feel free to to ask them and we'll see if we can if we can get to them at some stage um and i see i see we're good to go <laughs> we're good to go so we're getting quite used to to this uh, this live um, and media uh, game, aren't we, Petronal? Yes, we are. I must say, I enjoy it so much uh, because now we can connect and see each other and talk to each other, and actually also um, inform people about what we're still doing in in conservation while the whole world is in lockdown. Yeah, it's such a it's such an amazing platform. And, you know, again, for me, you know, I've said this in the past, just being able to break away because it has been such a challenging time for all of us and reach out to people who are doing such incredible work like yourself is um, is always such a joy. You know, it's always kind of the best part of my my week. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for making the time to chat to us. Um, I see a lot of people are, are joining the conversation. I encourage you guys to ask any questions that you might have. Um, and um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm chatting to Petronal Nivot, who is the founder of Care for Wild. Um, we met a couple of years ago. I'm we were trying to remember when we actually met you, um, Petronal, when we came and spent some time with you guys uh, um, as a team. Was it in, I think it was around 2017. Um, and I'm sure a lot has changed since then. Oh, yes, I must say, um, for us here in the beginning, you start off as a small orphanage. You think it's a small orphanage and then before you know it, it's just rhinos raining on us and it's a massive crisis and um, day and night you, you protect, you rehabilitate, you hand rear and you never know what, what you sign up for and uh, I must say what a challenging time. Um, it's going better at the moment, I must say. And, but 2015, 16, 17, I don't remember day and night. Uh, we lived in episodes and not in day and night. It was just too crazy. Hectic, eh? I, I saw recently and I, I shared a couple of your, um, your posts on Instagram. You guys are, are desperately looking for, for feed, um, TEF, in the form of, um, you know, obviously making sure you've got enough food to feed your rhino. Um, I guess one forgets how much these animals eat. Oh, you, you have to see this. This is actually impressive how they can eat. So if you think about the rhino bull, it's weighing more or less white rhino bull, more or less 1.8 tons. And they can eat up to 3% of their body mass a day. So even if we are on a reserve and on a sanctuary uh, in winter time, you know, you need to feed more. And um, we're busy expanding as well. And as we rewild these big rhinos, we're also expanding into other areas. But let me tell you, they eat at the moment about seven of the big round bales. And <laughs> I'm sure the guys will see it on our Instagram and care for a while. And um, you must just uh, experience this mega herbivore going through this food. It's like a Pac-Man. It's like yum, 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 yum. And you want to keep them healthy. You want to keep them in good condition through winter time. And that's where you sign up for this. You know, you can't say, listen, I want to rescue rhino orphans. You have to see this journey through until they rewild it and well established back in a healthy ecosystem. Yeah, I thought we would just raise that before we start our conversation with regards to kind of what you guys really need right now. And I guess appealing to anyone who's listening to this conversation in South Africa who's possibly in the agricultural space um, and is able to help with regards to, um, you know, donating, um, you know, uh, TEF. 
Um, is, it, is it Lucerne that you're looking for? What, is, what exactly is TEF? TEF, we will show you um, a little bit later when we're feeding Anchor with the audience. I can show you exactly what the TEF is. And uh, what's quite interesting, on our Rhino market, they can actually buy a bale of TEF and that will go through our uh, payment method. It will come straight to us and we will then go and order the correct TEF that we need for the specific age group. Uh, you know, you, you have these different stages of rehabilitation of these animals and their needs in these different stages. So um, it's quite important to look, look at the nutritional uh, um, uh, needs at certain stages. Okay, awesome. Well, again, guys, we encourage you to go have a look at the, the website and see how you can um, support by donating, um, you know, food to these, these rhinos. They really need it during this time. Um, but again, just to get back to our conversation, I think it would be great, um, Petronal, and, you know, for, for me as well, um, you know, I, I met you very briefly, you know, a couple of years ago, but it would be great to get a bit of, a bit of an idea of how, how you got started and, and where kind of your passion for conservation and animal husbandry started. Um, I know that you grew up in the area on a farm, but kind of where did it all begin for you? Uh, uh, James, I can't say. I think I'm, I'm born in this uh, type of thing. You know, I think uh, God just said, listen, you need to look after uh, the, the, the animals, you know, and I'm very glad for that. And I'm very blessed to be able to do that. So, I can't think about a time that I thought I will do something else. <laughs> I always thought, but that is what I'm supposed to do. You know, you, you, I'm, I'm going to help all these, all these animals. And before I know it, you know, we sit in a, uh, I was sitting with uh, uh, Endangered Species Protection Unit after I study. And then uh, what happened is you see the criminals and you see the need of the animals and the crime towards environment. And uh, my son at that stage was seven years old and I thought, okay, he must go to school now, you know? So I have to find a base. And uh, the next moment there were so many animals in the home that then I realized, listen, I have to then build something to, to keep these animals and to hand rear them. And as this was growing, uh, you know, you become very involved in training and in skills development because it doesn't help us to keep those information to ourselves. So one of the biggest things that, that I promote and definitely stand for is to hand information down to uh, next generations, to conserve, to understand what's happening. If it's water, ecosystem, you know, it doesn't help us to save a rhino, but we don't, or mega herbivore, or keystone species, but there's no ecosystem for them to live in. So I think this was always part of who I want to be and who I am. Um, it's like mixing a pot. <laughs> so so in, in 2001, you decided to, to found um, an NGO called, called Care for Wild. Um, and I guess it's, it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't all been smooth sailing. It was probably quite an interesting time to start because, you know, from 2001, we obviously had our peak of, you know, poaching specifically in your area of operation around Kruger um, and that area about a decade later. Um, but tell me a little bit about Care for Wild and how you founded um, the, the organization. And I see people are already asking what happened to your arm. And, you know, clearly it's not all, um, it's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not all a, an easy task. So, so walk us through Care for Wild. Listen, you know what? I never thought I would start Care for Wild. I think Care for Wild, you know, just came. And um, it wasn't started for rhinos or antelopes or birds or whatever species in need, you know. And then in 2008, some poaching started on the rhino um, agenda, if I can call it that. And then later on, 2012, 13, 14, 15, it was just rhinos. So the rhino sanctuary in itself, as in a non-profit, started actually later when people started to help me and donated money and so on. And we thought, we can't carry on with this. 
at least people need to have something back. So at the moment, we have Care for Wild, Rana Sanctuary, uh, South Africa, and U UK, and then US. So we have three platforms, and most probably we'll have Australia and Switzerland soon. But um, I can tell you the, the involvement of Rescue a Rhino is just a small part of anything, of any rescue. So after that, the whole rehabilitation um, roll out and uh, rewilding and reintroduction into the wild. And then it comes that we need now to protect this animal because what they have, the horn they, they have is a commodity, you know, that, that me and you know, it is um, the amounts that we're talking about is just something else. For us, it's keratin and it's horn is worth nothing. For us, the animal matters, but it's a commodity and it's a tradable com commodity. So the protection of Care for Wild then moved into 24-7 uh, guards with the rhino, this is rhino monitors, canine units. So this is where the arm comes from. And then <laughs> mounted units. And then I can tell you, um, uh, good fences, good cameras on the fences. So it's an inclusive uh, model with our communities. And I'm sure me and you will talk about the communities as well in a bit. So I never know that this will grow to, to this large, uh, you know, always if I, if I look at the run, I always say it's like tra training your dragon. But this became like a dragon um, with wings, and, and, it's, and we just need to give this wings. So I want to talk about Anchor a little bit later. Of how do we see rhinos and, and how do we see their future? But we will get to them. So, um, and yeah, it's, it's such an interesting point you make. It's almost been kind of an organic um, development with the demand in terms of orphaned rhinos and yeah, obviously sick rhinos, but also injured rhinos from the increased post poaching, specifically around Kruger National Park. I'm, I'm posting one or two pictures, which you probably can't see, um, you know, as we're talking, but I've got a picture of a rhino in the back of a helicopter here. Um, Talk us through what happens with regards to specifically animals that have been poached. So I think most people don't realize that, you know, a female or a cow will be poached and often the, 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 the orphan is left, um, sometimes killed, yeah. sadly, and even its horn harvested. But walk us through um, your role um, or what happens from rescuing a rhino to ending up at the orphanage and what your vision is for that rhino um, eventually. Yeah, that's it. That's an important one because the rescue is really 90% of, of what, what I would say uh, the successful releases of that rhino. So, uh, yes, we do have an MOU with the Kruger National Park and the Greater Kruger because people need to understand 80% of the world's uh, rhino uh, is basically in Mapumalanga and in the Kruger. So, we were here and we have some people say, but why are you doing it? And one I thought to myself, but why, why, why not? And mm. let's do this, you know, let's save these rhinos. So we will get a call from the Crooked National Park, Park or private reserve or one of the Mapumalanga parks and say, listen, we found a dead carcass and this uh, orphan baby uh, with the mom or running around or so on. So, Sometimes we're very involved with the rescue itself, also sending out some of our people, drones, uh, whatever, to go look for this rhino and then go and um, find the rhino. In that ca specific case, then the Kruger will dart the rhino, the veterinarians there, and they will put the rhino in the back of the helicopter and fly the rhinos here. So most of these rhinos, before anything else, they were, they, they, they were flown here, then we will be ready to, to um, receive them. So the room we are in is the ICU. So we will be anytime, day or night, ready to receive an animal. So there's ER24 bags in the back. There's list uh, that goes into a vehicle or into crates. So we basically, anytime, day or night, ready to go 
and uh, rescue rhino. So uh, in our instance, remember, if you do not do a rescue quick, the predators uh, also then attack uh, this baby rhino. So in Sophia's case, you know, there was about 12 to 20 hyenas on her mom's carcass. And the hyenas was also attacking her. So most of our babies uh, that's coming into the center is coming in with severe wounds. Sometimes hacks wounds from the poachers that they hack these babies away from the mom. Um, sometimes also bite wounds from hyenas and other predators. And also gunshot wounds like Blossom. They shot her through her neck, you know, shot Sabeba also in her shoulder. So what I... What we've seen, me and my team, will take your breath away. Um, it, it sometimes you you stop believing in humanity if you see what people are really doing to to this poor rhinos. Absolutely. I mean, I was actually based in Kruger as well during you know the time where rhino poaching just escalated um, beyond belief. Um, and we also literally watched a population of rhino in our, our area of operation disappear. Um, and, you know, I guess the lucky ones are the ones that end up at, you know, Care for Wild. And I, I've seen pictures on your um, feed of, you know, young calves that have actually had their tails bitten off by hyenas and, you know, arrived at Care for Wild in an, in an absolutely awful state. Um, I hear one of your dogs in, in the background. Um, but there is... No, no, it's, it's, it's all good. Um, there, there's a, quite an interesting uh, pertinent question that comes from Elizabeth, um, which, you know, we've obviously reached out to a number of, of people around Africa, and I guess in different areas during COVID, people are experiencing different things with regards to poaching. Um, what, is, what has been your experience? This, this question comes from Elizabeth. What has been your experience with regards to um, over the COVID period, has there been an increase in poaching? Have you had more calls or, or heard of uh, more stories where you've had to rescue orphans? I know you rescued one just recently um, who hopefully we'll get a chance to meet a little later. Um, but has, have you seen or heard of an increase in poaching during COVID? I have heard an increase in Limpopo, most definitely. Uh, in the Kruger National Park and the surrounding parks, it was much better. And remember, there's different reasons for this because people couldn't move, you know, they couldn't drive. And the park was closed for visitors as well. So do remember when the syndicates, very well organized syndicates, then go into the Kruger, they enter through the gates uh, in many cases, not all the cases, and then will shoot an animal and will, the, the, the the horns will leave with another car. So in this instance, we have seen uh, n not many poaching cases. It was a good one. I do know Limpopo has been hammered, but the Kruger National Park and surrounding areas actually done quite well. Another thing is um, people then also could go and attend to specific areas and um, with essential services. So we also knew who dri who's driving around and who's allowed to drive around. And that also was very, very helpful. Yeah, I think having, um, you know, people on the ground, although uh, Kruger hasn't had tourists for, you know, a number, a number of months, they've also got, you know, a number of boots on the ground, which is, which is certainly helpful and, and a presence in, in Kruger. So that's, that's really great to hear. And I hope that answers your, your question, Elizabeth. Um, and then, you know, I know after, you know, spending some time with you um, and, you know, spending some time with our mutual friend, Dean Ruder, just seeing what goes into um, looking after these animals once they arrive at Care for, for Wild. It's, 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 it's crazy to think just how much effort and energy is required from you and your team um, just to make sure these animals survive. Um, what are some of the things that, you know, maybe we wouldn't, um, have thought about with regards to what you have to do to raise um, an orphaned rhino? I think sometimes people uh, do not understand the effort and the time that's going into this, you know. This little baby has a council of dads looking after him, you know. So it's 24, he's drinking every mm. second uh, hour and um, what we have to do, you have to look at dehydration, hypoglycemia, 
stress related um, um, needs, you know, sometimes what they will do, they will start chewing on things, you know, maybe do not do well on the milk, um, maybe with the wounds and so on, really a big problem. So there's a whole list of that we're going through, impactation as well. You know, we need to look at ulcers. So they tend to get a lot of tummy ulcers. So we have a list that we have to click before we can say that we have a stable patient. Um, you know, in the beginning, when they're just arriving, they actually don't know what's going on. So, so they're also still looking for their mom. So we developed almost an ear for rhino language and how they talk mm. to us and, and how they do things. I see Rachel needs me to move in a little bit. I'm just going to move a little bit in, James. No. <laughs> How is that so fine? <laughs> no, you, you're good. <laughs> there we go. So for, for me to say what the people do not know, is sometimes people think, yes, I want to do this. The emotional trauma that this mm. animal is going through and add then wounds to it and add stress. So you get this different, different pillars and different things of, of what they have to cope with. You know, different smells, different uh, noises. And um, all these things is, is so intense for them. So you really have to know what you're doing um, to see this process through, to be able you and enable you and your team to put this animal back into a crush where you can really become the rhino that he's supposed to be. Because that's ultimately what we want to do. Because every single rhino matter. We need to save every single rhino. And we need to save it in an ethical, responsible manner. Uh, so that we can ensure the long survival of this uh, black and white rhinos uh, um, in our country. So, so for me, it's important to make sure every little drop that's going into a bottle um, must, we must do that with, with cleanliness, hygiene, professionalism, and monitor the whole process. So at the moment, we're busy developing a little bit of a new milk formula as well uh, for the Stellenbosch uh, uh, University to see if we can bring some of the milk in different stages nearer to uh, what the mom's milk composition is. And then our rhino monitors as well is with these animals that's already released in the bigger areas 24 seven. So they're sitting with the app and we're developing an app on language, rhino language. Is this rhino looking for his friends? Uh, is he, does he want to fight? Does he want to mate? <laughs> um, or what different languages uh, can we find in, in the vocabulary of, of, of rhino um, uh, dictionary. So all these make us uh, uh, excellent team or, or more helpful um, when we need to help other countries. So at the moment, Care for World is also helping a group of people with a black rhino in Zimbabwe, uh, another black rhino in Tanzania, the Cremetti Fund, um, white rhino Botswana, and then another rhino in Namibia. So we're trying to get information out and to gather as much uh, information as possible to, to enable us to save uh, other rhinos in other areas as well. That's so awesome. And it was actually going to be my next question because, um, you know, so often you find, uh, I guess, conservation um, NGOs and organizations kind of working in isolation. And it's so great to hear you um, collaborating and reaching out with, you know, various other, other organizations um, like the Gometi Fund. I actually chatted to Grant Burden the other day about yes. the reintroduction program um, of the, the, the Black Rhino. Um, and uh, we, were, we were chatting to IPF the other day as well with regards to their, their rhino in Zimbabwe. But um, exactly. With regards, with regards to the milk, um, is, it, is it similar to um, what elephants would typically feed on as, as youngsters? Because again, I, I've seen um, you know, the elephant orphanage up in, in Kenya, um, also reaching out to a uh, you know, South African orphanage and, and, and guys sharing um, information and sharing statistics and sharing research, which I think is so, so key, isn't it? Absolutely key. 
for us, um, looking at Rana milk, it's a, a little bit like horse milk. And um, low in sugars, uh, or oh, high in sugars and low in fat. So it's a little bit watery. But uh, we're looking at the solids in there, we're looking at the protein in there, because like I said, ultimately, we want to, to mimic what mom will do for this little one. And we want to do the right thing in the quickest possible way to put that animal back with other rhinos as a crush so that the emotional support and rhino language come from other rhinos and, and not people, not imprints on people. Yeah, and I think that's, that's quite key to reiterate is that kind of your end goal is to actually release rhino back into the wild. And I think um, quite an interesting question that's just come through from Wild Intentions is, and this is a question I don't know the answer to, but what is the success rate um, when releasing rhinos back into the wild from your experience? I have to say, I can't wait to actually answer this question. Remember, this is a, a very intense uh, situation. If you think about from the second that rhino baby got orphaned and maybe like, like Anchor, he's five days old. This rhinos only start breeding females at six, seven years old, the bulls at eight to 10 years old. So we, we in this for the long run. So this is what makes Kefawat also so unique. The group that's in the felt at the moment is that age. They, some of them six years old, they, they, they're not teenagers. Uh, they're driving us crazy with all these new tricks, you know, <laughs> and, and fighting territory. So Storm is fighting us and, and uh, Timby and Olive doesn't want to, to, to mate with with Tank, the lover boy, so we have all these, these uh, the lover <laughs> seven alarm stuff, you know, days of our lives. So it is amazing to live with these animals and to see what they do every day and to, to record this, to be able to answer this. So this will be successful when this orphans breed. And yesterday, um, we one of the guards on this tablet, the Rana monitors, took a photo um, of one of the, the, the rhinos climbing on the other rhino. So it's all love and love and love, but careful all the moment. You say, drama of the plot. <laughs> yeah, so to, to think you, hold, you were holding that baby in your mm. arms and it was 60, 60 kilograms and now suddenly, oh wow, it's 1.8 tons and ready to breed. Um, it's a long process. Do remember, then that mom uh, will be pregnant, uh, gestation period will be 18 months. And then only the baby will be born. And then if her, that baby is almost three years old, she will come in calf again. So I would love the audience to understand that this is also why it's so sad if there's a poaching and the mom's dead, and maybe mm. there's a three-year-old calf dead that, that's been poached and she had a fetus because immediately there's three, three generations of cows gone. And I hope people mm. will then make the sums that you, you cannot breed them back if we don't act now. The whole mm. breeding project is just taking so much time. That's why it's so important to save each and every rhino. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, so, so for us as South Africans, you know, we've got that stronghold left in Kruger National Park, you know, that large populations of, of, of you know, white and, you know, to a certain extent, black rhino. So, um, you know, we're, uh, it's part of our heritage and certainly something that we, we would really want to preserve. Um, I think people also forget how, I mean, it must be amazing. You were talking about the size of a rhino. You know, a rhino calf is quite small when it's born. You know, if you compare it to a giraffe calf, which weighs at like 100 kilos, uh, a rhino calf is like, you know, 40, 50 kilos, and it grows into like a two and a half ton animal. It must be one of the most amazing things watching them grow and, uh, and how quickly they grow. I cannot tell you the blessing to see that and um, how clever they are. And that uh, a lot of the times they teach us, you know, they show us things. And um, 
just to see the world through their eyes. And I think if people ask me, why do I love Rhino so much? Um, um, you know, I, 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 if you look at the Rhino, the way I'm blessed to be looked at the Rhino is I don't see the devastation. I don't see this, this trauma. I, I, I see the future and what we're going to do and how happy he will be and how many people love him and want him to, to be the Rhino he needs to be. So, so it, from my heart, I, I know Rhino so well. And even the color of the eyes, you know, if you think about the bright brown eyes and the blue circle around that, and if they look back at you, what do they see? They just see someone that wants to help. They don't look back at us and say, oh, you know, that's the people that, that kill us and so on. So they're so resilient. You know, we, we, we as, a, as a, a race, the, a human race, why don't we do more? Um, they waiting for us to catch up and say, hey, we, yeah, we, mm -hmm. we need to, to, to do this together. And, and if I look at them, I sometimes look at them and, and I see uh, even this small baby now, and you're going to meet him now in a second. I, I see what, what the future holds for him. And, and I'm just so, so fortunate to, to make sure that um, we need to do everything we can to give him that good uh, future. We mustn't now save him and not take the responsibility in not giving him the best future that he can have. No, well, uh, you know, again, you do such incredible work, uh, Petronel. Someone's just commenting, saying how much admi admiration they have for your passion and your attitude and your commitment. So um, uh, we are so excited about meeting. We actually haven't talked too much to meeting um, a young rhino anchor who was rescued, I think, in June. He was a couple of days when you days old when you rescued him, and we're going to be meeting him in a couple of minutes. But just before we do... Um, something else we wanted to chat about was engaging with local communities. We spoke about it earlier with regards to it's not necessarily just about um, rescuing rhino. There's so much more that you do um, at Care for Wild. And one of the key pillars is engaging with local communities and job creation. Can we talk to that briefly before um, we talk about some of the challenges you guys are facing? Oh, absolutely. You know what? As we develop, uh, we were fortunate to have the most amazing community surrounding us. And if you do not have an inclusive model um, and include communities in what you do in conservation, you're dead in the water. That's a fact. So last year, we were, were really, really so proud. We could get um, through the YES program of uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, we could employ 400 people, believe it or not. And those people are working in the reserve, alien invasive plant control, fire management, roads, and vegetable gardens. You know, through lock, lockdown, we all ate the most amazing veggies that are coming from our gardens. You know, it is, it is uh, spinach, onions. <laughs> it is abundance. Awesome. But the abundance is not only in... Um, what we planted and the successes in the vegetable gardens with the local communities, it is to see the people also buying into what we're doing. You see, so mm. we have soccer teams, we have netball teams, and then we have a very sustainable model. And the people can go and have a look at it actually on our website as well. Uh, we partnered with the Lumshu Trust, and it's one of the communities nearby us to have macadamia farm. We're going to plant, we've planted four hectares macadamias and we're going to plant onions and cabbage now next week. And that's completely um, inclusive of the community, work creation, and then um, basically also food uh, schemes. So through all of this, if you can send green beans, cabbage, and those type of things to your communities also during this time, the the uh, the beauty of of this i cannot explain to you uh your information coming out of that areas as well 
is some of these those people do not have jobs, but they have skills. And if you then get them involved, you will find diamonds in there. You you uh, the Ranas gives us this opportunity to find these most amazing talented people and to save the heritage for every one of us, or our area, our community. So um, very proud to say uh, how many jobs we're also now in a position to create here at Fair for Wild. That's awesome. I think, you know, having the support of the local community is, is just so key in, you know, in all different aspects, whether they're providing you guys with information, um, whether, you know, they're putting a value on, on wildlife and educating themselves and future generations. And I guess, like you say as well, um, you know, we've got such a terrible unemployment rate um, in South Africa to be in a position where you can actually directly employ um, people from local communities is, you know, so, so empowering for them. Oh, yes. And like I said to you as well, you know, um, for other uh, uh, organizations and partners, we um, also are helping st uh, study bursaries. So if there's anyone that, that wants to help and say, listen, if there's anyone that they want to sponsor, in a specific um, line like animal wealth, wildlife management, you know, like fire management or something like that, alien invasive and so on for Gaza, uh, that will be wonderful. And um, um, there's definitely already people helping with that. And we're very grateful because I can tell you uh, to see the rhinos again, then through their eyes, remember they had never seen a rhino. And suddenly, they with the rhinos every day. So it's almost easier then to protect these rhinos and to talk to them about socioeconomical problems, the children playing here, the soccer teams that's doing so well. There's a rhino cup, you know, and after COVID, we're going to start up the rhino cup again. There's some of the organizations that that um, sponsoring the clothes for these soccer teams. And during those times, we get uh, time and opportunities to solve problems and to talk about conservation. So we see it differently. And then suddenly, we actually see it the exact same thing. It is for our future. That's why we save these rhinos, for our area, for our community, for our future. So we're very blessed. So, you know, we talked to it a bit earlier as well. Um, it's not easy running, um, you know, a, a rhino orphanage. And I think any South African will realize, you know, once they understand the value, um, even on the black market of a, a, a rhino horn, you, you realize the incentive for poachers. So, I mean, you guys face all sorts of challenges. And I remember thinking when I first came to um, your area of operation, just how you had to um, incorporate so much security, just, just one aspect uh, in terms of, um, you know, challenge with regards to protecting these rhino. What are some of the challenges you face in a normal environment, not even considering, um, you know, the, the challenging climate we're currently in, but what are some of the challenges you face um, at Care for Wild, Wild looking after all these rhino? You know, the challenges are many, especially when you realize that the, the value of the rhino uh, uh, is in the horn and mm. not the animal. And um, some of the challenges you, you will also know, James, is to keep your teams uh, motivated um, to make sure during these cold periods that they have good, good food, you know, good shelter, uniforms, all that. So uh, it's not only money you're talking about, but it's also still fighting this pandemic, if we, we want to call it, um, mm -hmm. on different levels, political levels, activism levels, um, you know, the syndicates trying to get information. You know, like I said, trusting your, your personnel, working with them every day. And then, you know, like the disease in COVID, we also had to, to, to have quarantine camps because, you know, you can't, suddenly send everyone on their normal cycles home and they get ill because remember they're breadwinners. Most of these people 
are also breadwinners. They are looking mm. after families. So you also need to keep them healthy and them safe. So it is an asset. Uh, uh, runners are asset to the country, but the people are the biggest asset. So to keep them safe while they are looking after the rhinos is as important as keeping the rhinos safe. So this is just some of the, the challenges. And like I say, um, um, long hours sometimes, cold, yeah. food, um, you know, sometimes a threat of your own life or your people's lives. But you can't face this in fear. You face this in faith. And um, because why did you sign up for this? This is what we do. We save animals to save people in, in healthy ecosystems. And I don't want to do anything else. And I think that's why I have this. I must tell them about my arm and then we must feed anchor. Awesome. Tell Can us I the tell story. Them about my arm, Please. James. Yeah, of course. Okay. okay. It is a crazy story. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't expect anything less from you. <laughs> you know, when we're taking out bios to the animals in the fell, it yes. is a massive operation, you know, to, to see. <laughs> oh, I already know where this is see... going. <laughs> you know, you always think you're very strong and you think you can, <laughs> you can lift the rhinos because if you work with mega herbivores, it's a privilege, you know, they, they dinosaur-like and they big and they, they massive. <laughs> and it's amazing. And um, sometimes they storm at you and sometimes you run away and things happen unexpectedly, you know. So this was in that, you know. If you, if you, want, to, if you want to really know what's happening, I'm just joking. Um, we was putting out the bales out Sunday morning and on the way back, you know, I have a dog. Some of the people saw it previously. It's Goofy. His name is Goofy. He's a Weimaraner. The sweetest thing ever. And then my other dog is a Dutchman. She's a Bullshoinky. So, so her name is Cindy. So then there's a new addition to this. And this is a German short hair. Uh, so we have a very, very well uh, um, uh, functioned canine unit. <laughs> but if you don't look, <laughs> they run your legs underneath you out. What? Hey. And I fell on a rock. <laughs> so you got so, so you got taken off. No, you got taken off by one of your dogs and you and you actually ended up breaking your arm. It's broken, right? Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. But but it so. does help, you know. But then if anyone wants to come and fight and think they're going to come into parts of rhinos. I'm going to, to hit the <laughs> hell out of them with my arm now because of the proper cause. We're going to, <laughs> going to fight who, them. You see? Who, yeah. who, would have, who would have thought you, who would have thought you worked with two ton animals or two and a half ton animals on a daily basis and you ended up breaking your arm um, and it was, the cause was a little dog. So, yeah. It That's is, a, it is, it, yeah, it is mind blowing. So, so we cannot wait to introduce our audience to Anka. Um, my council of dads is, is standing uh, ready to, to show the audience um, uh, Anka and, and please something that you guys have to look at and, and we will show you as well on the camera is you must look at his horns. A horn is not a bone. It's loose mm. on a rhino. So Anchor doesn't have horns. He's too small. So a horn is growing like your nail or like your hair. And, and then it forms and they scratch it everywhere. And then it grows out. So um, we, we would like to show the audience that uh, Anchor doesn't have a horn. He's too small. He's too tiny. And we got him a sheep. I know that. <laughs> because he's, he's got a friend. Small. Yeah. Yeah, I got a friend and um, a very woolly friend for winter. So he was just too tiny to introduce to the crashes of rhinos that we have um, on the farm. Um, 
and it's too cold as yet. You know, it's very cold here at the moment. So we cannot take that chance. So he's still in ICU and still in the evenings on heaters and every second hour we're feeding him. So are you guys ready? Yeah, we're ready. He was just a couple of days old when you, when you rescued him, right? Yeah, five days old, yeah. Wow, okay, awesome. Okay, we, let's do this. Awesome, looking forward to it. Okay, Lekker, thank you. Okay, okay. Council of Dads, come in. <laughs> okay, you guys must be quick. I'm going to stand near the audience. Alrighty, that, this Gerard. Hello, hello. Okay, guys, hey, come look in. at that little thing, man. Here we go. This anchor, this anchor. That is Ronald and and then Sean. You must get the bottle, Ronald. <laughs> and hey guys. this is sheep in the back and Gerard. So this is the council of dads. <laughs> Someone wants to know what's the sheep's name. Wow, look at that. So you guys are actually feeding him milk. This is something that you would do how many times a day? 12 times a day, every second hour. Every second yeah, hour, my goodness. Awesome. Yo, yo. So look at this. We thought just to show you all the dads and these like a nice night pen for the night. See, so he's got a, a lot of people looking after him and a lot of love. He looks like a, a happy guy. So he's been with you guys for, <laughs> geez, just over a month. Yeah, at the, at the moment he's three weeks old. And um, like you can see, yes, this, we just show you sometimes we use different uh, keepers. Because he's, if the animal is a bit older, you know, it's not necessarily needed. But in this case, uh, some of these people are off and some of them on. So that's why we decided just to have a little bit more people looking after this man. And there's no volunteers. So we're looking at the moment, this specific group that you guys see here. Uh, on their own, they're looking after about uh, 15 rhinos. A rhino baby. So this is not the only baby that's on milk. So these guys know how to make a milk bottle. Make no mistake. <laughs> Good idea. To try. You know, and you were, son. No, you've actually, you framed it up really nicely here. So you're also saying it's, you know, one forgets it's actually quite hard sometimes in the, in the bush to age a rhino. Um, but this, this little guy is what, five, five weeks old? Oh, look at him. How old? How old is he? Three months? Yeah, asking five weeks? This one? Three and a half. Yeah. Three and a half Three. weeks. Three and a half weeks. He's still, he's still, look at his belly button. Come, have a look at his belly button. Wow. <laughs> Can you still and see the umbilical cord? Yeah, a little bit. There it is. There's a little bit of it still there. But it's doing very well. Show them the feet, Rachel. Guys, have a look at his sweet feet. Come. Come, there we go. There we go. Amazing. Hey, look at those three toes. No other animal in the world has, has um, you know, feet like that. There's a no. quick question here, which is quite relevant. Um, with regards to having so many keepers, uh, is, is one of the reasons for that petronal to keep them rotating and so that they... The, the young rhino don't imprint on, on an individual keeper. Yes, exactly. Because do you, you must think about the emotional strain when this animal needs to part from a specific handler. Um, you know, so it is for both, for, for the handler as well as the animal, much easier when we rotate. So we're not always all with this baby. There's at one stage one person with him and one person feeding. And most of the time, uh, when they're older, let's say they come in at about six months or five months or three months, we're pairing them immediately, immediately with, with, um, uh, with another rhino. I'm not dummy. 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 I'm not
That's sad. He's just he's just looking for a little bit more milk. He's and hungry, eh? Yo, yo. This is Tip. Wait, let me show you Tip. Can you see Tip? Okay. Yes. Yo. Okay, this is the, the food that he's on. He's still not on solid. He's too young. Uh, he will start nibbling um, from a month, but not, not really the digestive system can't do anything with it. And from two months and older, he will do very well on that, you know, starting with solid. And then that we re um, actually then introduce, introducing different things to him. And what's his story? Did he, did, where, did you, where did you rescue him from? And um, was, his, was his mother poached? No, uh, this specific animal's mom wasn't poached. But what was quite impressive was the uh, uh, rangers uh, were really on this. So they know that he, he was born and then they kept on looking after him and his mom. And it looks like the mom had a previous injury where a bull uh, and maybe in a shuffle injured her. So it, mm. sounds, it sounds like her diaphragm ripped. And unfortunately, she passed away. But the rangers uh, found him early, early morning on the 13th of June and called us immediately. So there wasn't even darting involved. You know, they could, they could get hold of him. And immediately so we could transfer him here. Yeah. Luckily, he got colostrum in. And just to tell the viewers what colostrum is, is that first milk mm. um, that you get. Yeah. Maybe we can go in. Okay, let's go. Hi. Hi, Baba. Rachel, you can show them the wall. Just hold like that. Okay. And if you see this... This is the area where the second horn will come out. And this is the, the front horn, but there's no horn. <laughs> so if anyone wants to, to understand how this works, slowly but surely there will be a little knob coming out here. And then this horn will grow. And then the second horn will grow later. Here we go. There's a little bit more water. Thank you, Harold. And it's, it's tragic, isn't it, Petronal? I mean, we've actually seen young rhinos like this even having their little bit of keratin that you can see on that posterior horn actually hacked out because, you know, these poachers are looking at getting every single gram of, of horn that they can get their hands on. Um, yeah, you, the guys, there, there are quite a few questions coming through. So if you do have questions, now is an opportunity. Um, Petronal, what we've realized as well with these calls is we, we, um, we'll get kicked off um, once we <laughs> approach an hour. Um, and and that'll, that'll be in a couple of minutes. So if you okay. guys do have any questions, please feel free to, to ask. Um, we're currently being introduced to a three and a half week old rhino that's been rescued by Care for Wild. Um, he was a couple of days old when he was rescued. His name's Anchor, and uh, it's, as you can see, feeding time. If I just want to tell the audience, remember, rhinos can hear very well, and they can smell very well, but they can't see very well. And we can clearly see this, this in this little man. So if you, if you walk too fast and he can't really uh, focus on you, he will get a fright. So how you work around this animal is very important. He must know the smells and you must know how you work around him. So he's a baby. He's a tiny, tiny baby with all baby needs. A question's come through from Kat asking, do you know which crash you'll reintroduce it to eventually? But... Um... But he's still very young. He'll still be on his own for a while. Um, and, um, and he gets fed, did you say, every two hours throughout the day, 24 hours a day? Yeah. Look, at the moment, the crushes, the young, uh, we have Benji. Benji's about seven, eight months old. And he's with Diana. And she's about two years old. So they came in earlier this year. So he can't go in with them because they're too big. So saying this and touch with, I hope it's not, <laughs> so it's not true <laughs> or we're not hoping for another rhino. But a lot of the times, the animal that will come in now will be paired with him because the bonds in the other crushes is already too strong. 
So the other cross I might be looking at uh, could be lazuli and ribbon, cat. So it might be lazuli and ribbon. We can also test that. Or uh, there's blossom and maya. So as he grows older, we will start taking him down to meet them and see if that bond between some of the other crushes are too strong. They will, they will push him out, and that's what we don't want that. Hey, he's coming out. Come on, boy. Here we go. Here we go. Dude, man. <laughs> and I guess one of the reasons, one of the reasons for um, the introduction of the sheep is also as a companion while they're so young. So you, you talked about introducing him to a sheep. That, that is just to keep him, um, to, to give him company in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it, and it's, uh, I hope it, uh, if in our case, I would have loved it to be another rhino uh, because that's mm. the best thing for them to get used to other rhinos as soon as possible. But in his case, this little man was so tiny that we decided to have this little wool, woolly baby there in the back as his companion, also to keep him nice and warm. And why? We have goats and we sometimes have a sheep. Sheep more for white rhino, goats more for black rhino because of no the uh, diet. The diet. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And. What, what, we're kind of running out of time and I really, while we've got so, there's so many people who are interested in um, learning more and, and helping where they can. And, and really, I guess this is an opportunity and a platform where you as a viewer can really, can really get involved. Um, Petronal, how can people help you guys? How are, what, what are some of the things we can do in terms of uh, supporting Care for Wild and the important work you're doing? You know what, every single thing helps and how they can get involved is really on our website and our Instagram. It's Care for Wild Instagram and we're doing a big drive for food at the moment for this little man for milk and then for tea. Um, so please, if they can go on our Instagram and our Facebook, it will be wonderful. And it's, uh, we, I think we need about 600 bales still for the season um and i think we are on 80 bales so guys go bale each we will do funny stuff uh, just for you guys to help <laughs> us with the when you <laughs> just going in and sleep james thank you so much for the opportunity thank you it's such a privilege to talk to you Oh, thank you so much for making the time and 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 also introducing us to little anchor he's a real sweetie um, and again, what we've done, guys, is we've also put a link to Care for Wild in um, the Black Bean Productions bio. Um, so I would encourage you to go check out the Care for Wild Instagram page. Um, you can click on it literally by following this live and see how you can support and, and, and I guess just educate yourself about, you know, the great work these guys are doing. They're proudly South African. And as a South African petronal to another South African, I just want to commend you on the amazing work that you do. And Hopefully, when lockdown's over, we can come visit. Oh, please. And we will keep on fighting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Thank you, James. Thank you, guys. Go well. Go well, go well. Bye. Thank you so Ciao. much. Cheers, Petronal. Bye, Anka. Bye. Bye, Anka. <laughs>